Christian Parenting. Many young people are raised in the church, but leave their faith behind when they become adults. Join us for this important conversation on Family Vision. Hi, my name is Lainey Reno. Welcome to Family Vision with my parents, Dr. Rob and Amy Reno. Strengthening families through practical, encouraging, and real conversations. Rob Reno here with Visionary Family Ministries. Thank you for taking time to be a part of the Family Vision community. We love the chance to spend this time with you. Well, in today's episode, we're going to talk about a sensitive and difficult subject, and that is prodigal children. Teenagers, young adults who perhaps were raised in a Christian church or raised in a Christian home, but now are no longer following the Lord. And you've probably all heard the statistics out there, uh, 60%, 70%, whatever the number is of young people that, again, are raised in a Christian church or Christian family, but then when they become adults, they say, this is not for me anymore. And a lot of times those statistics just focus on the the child or the young adult. But the reality is, is that those prodigals have parents and grandparents who love them, parents and grandparents who are still in the church and grieving the spiritual loss of what's happened in the life of their son or their daughter. So these next couple episodes, we're going to be talking uh, about this challenge of how do we reach and bless and encourage prodigal kids? Is it too late? And one of the big themes that's going to run through everything that I want to share with you is that no, 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 it is not too late. It is never too late. As long as you've got breath, as long as that child has breath, no matter how old they are, no matter how far away they live, it's not too late for God to use you as a mom or dad or grandma or grandpa, to be a spiritual blessing in the life of that child. Let me tell you a couple of uh, stories, because this whole subject of reaching prodigal kids, I got into this as a youth pastor, because as a youth pastor, I would see many students as in high school that they seem to be doing well in their faith. And I actually used to think that, hey, if a young person at 17 or 18 was thriving in their faith, well, they're good to go. The cement has hardened and and they're going to follow Jesus forever. And unfortunately, I I really don't believe that anymore because I saw so many young people who were doing well at that point and then by 23, 25, 30 were far from God. So to me, like, how do I know, even with my own children, how do I know if, if their faith really is their own And I think the answer for me now is when I see them out of the house, on their own, following Jesus as their own man, as their own woman, or if they're, especially if they're a parent, that they are teaching now my grandchildren to follow Jesus, then I know that they have received the baton and they are running with it in their generation. Let me tell you a couple of stories. Uh, The names are changed here to, uh, to protect the guilty, I guess. First story is Mike. Mike, when he was a sophomore in high school, came to our youth group. And Mike had come out of um, a very difficult background. He came through the foster care system. And I was actually on a hiking trip, a wilderness trip with Mike, and had a chance to share the gospel with him. And the Lord worked in his life, and he put his faith in Jesus. And he quickly became a leader in our youth group. After high school, he stayed in the area and he became a volunteer leader in our youth group. So he's a college kid, and he's helping out in the youth group. It's awesome. Well, eventually he moves away, and a few years later, my phone rings, and Mike's now 25 years old. Hey, Rob, it's Mike. Do you remember me? Of course I remember you. Well, I am now engaged, and I'd like for you to be the pastor to officiate our wedding. And boy, what an honor that was for me. So uh, I said, boy, I'm so happy you called. I'd love to see you. I'd love to meet your fiance. You know, I can't say yes quite yet because I actually kind of have to kick the tires a little bit and just check how this couple's doing. So we get together and pretty soon in this conversation, it becomes obvious to me that Mike's fiance is not a Christian. So I'm like, oh boy, what am I going to do here? I mean, the Bible says that you can't be unequally yoked. A Christian should not marry a non-Christian. And as a pastor, I can't officiate that ceremony. But I just met this young lady. And of course, I don't want to do anything that would offend her in any way. So I'm going to say, boy, I'm going to have to handle this pretty delicately. 
So I said, hey, I, I'm, a, you know, I know it's a little sensitive, but I'm kind of getting the sense that the two of you may be on different pages when it comes to spiritual or religious things. And there was silence on the other side. They just sort of stared at me. So I'm like, all right, well, I guess I got to turn the volume up a little bit. I said, okay, so what, let, let me ask you another way. What if God were to bless you with children someday? Uh, what would be the plan for their spiritual training? And at this point, Mike chimes in and he says, well, there's a lot of good religions in the world. And my job, our job is to expose our kids to all the different religions and let them pick. Now, I'm sitting in my chair in my office, but emotionally, spiritually, mentally, I have been blasted back. I'm on the floor. I'm flat on my back. I can't even believe what I just heard. So the reality was, see, I was concerned about this couple being unequally yoked. But the truth was they were very equally yoked. Mike was no longer a practicing Christian. I uh, wasn't even sure if he wanted to use that title to describe himself anymore. Another story, Jenny. Jenny, at the age of 18, was a worship leader in our church. If you came on a typical Sunday, you might see Jenny up there with her guitar helping to lead the congregation in, in worship. Well, she went off to college in Washington, D.C., and it was uh, the Sunday in between Christmas and New Year's of her sophomore year. So she'd be a year and a half away from high school graduation. And I was preaching that Sunday. I was the associate pastor. And the Sunday between Christmas and New Year's is the graveyard shift for pastors. The senior pastor is probably not preaching that Sunday. He is assigned it to someone else, namely me. So uh, I'm preaching that day and Jenny's there. She's back for, from Christmas break. And I get an email from Jenny later the afternoon, later that afternoon with concerns about the message. That's the subject line, concerns about the message. I say, well, I'd be interested to hear what, what Jenny has to say. So basically, she said that she was offended that I continued to refer to the Bible as the Word of God. In other words, let's open the Word of God to Psalm chapter 5. Well, the Word of God in Ephesians 2 says da 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 da, da. Now, I was not preaching a message about the Bible. Sometimes there are sermons that actually are about the Bible and about Scripture, but I wasn't doing that. I was just referring to the Bible, the Scriptures, the Word of God. And she said, when you refer to the Bible as the Word of God, it sounds to me like you're saying that the Bible is the only divinely inspired book. And I find that to be very narrow-minded and, frankly, bigoted of you. And I was like, wow. Now, I, I was not trying to make the point there that the Bible is the only divinely inspired book, but I'm glad she picked up on it because that's exactly what I believed is to be true. And so what impacted me is that this young lady in, in 18 months goes from worship leader in the church to being offended that the pastor is referring to the Bible as the Word of God. These kinds of stories are replicating themselves millions and millions of times over in our culture. And we've done this survey at churches all over the country. We've surveyed empty nest parents, parents of adult kids, and we found that two-thirds of empty nest parents in the church have at least one of their adult children far from God. Let me say that again. Two-thirds of empty nest parents in the church have at least one of their adult children far from God. And it is the most painful part of their life, so painful, in fact, that they don't talk about it very much because they're at church with all the other, you know, perfect, happy families, all the other families who uh, have it all together and all their kids are following Jesus. And so there's this overwhelming sense of burden and guilt and shame that goes with this for these parents of prodigals. And if this is you, you have a prodigal son or, or daughter or brother or family member, just a few key messages, and we're going to unpack some biblical principles to how we can respond to this. But uh, the first encouragement is just that you're not alone. You're not alone. Again, two-thirds of empty nest parents in the church have at least one adult child far from God. And then it's never too late. It's never too late. You see, the world is going to come at you with a lie that it is too late 
for you to have a spiritual impact on this adult child, on this older teen child. Obviously, they don't live in your home anymore. Obviously, you can't treat them like a child. They're not. They're a grown adult. Maybe they live a thousand miles away. Maybe uh, terrible things have happened in your relationship. Maybe you're even estranged from your son or daughter. But I want to encourage you, based on the scriptures that I'm going to share with you today, it's never too late. As long as you've got breath, as long as they've got breath, it's never too late for God to use you as a spiritual blessing and encouragement in the life of your son or daughter. And then I want to encourage you to really set your heart and mind clearly on the goal. Set your heart and mind clearly on the goal. And, and, and what is that? The way I would say it is this. The, the goal is your son or daughter loving God with all their heart, fully trusting in Jesus for their present and their future, and arriving safely home. That would be heaven together. Your son or daughter, loving God with all their heart, fully trusting in Jesus for their present and their future, and arriving safely home together. We get a lot of prayer requests from families around the world. You can send your prayer requests to us at podcast at visionaryfam.com. And a lot of those prayer requests are for adult children. Pray for my son. He's in a difficult job. Pray for my daughter. She's in a difficult marriage. And those prayer requests are are important, and, and we do lift those up. But sometimes I wish that we would get more prayer requests like this. God, pray for my son. He's not walking with the Lord. Pray for God to restore him to a relationship with God through Christ. Pray for my daughter. She's not saved. Pray for God to give her the gift of salvation of faith and repentance. In other words, if our kids are far from the Lord, that needs to be the focus of our prayers. Pray for their job, yes. Pray for their marriage, yes. But their spiritual condition should be top priority. That should be the the heavy lifting in our prayer life. Now, over the next couple episodes, I'm going to share four principles with you, four biblical principles for reaching a prodigal. These are not magic formulas. These are not do one, two, three, uh, and, and your kids will return to Christ or be restored to you. These are just principles God gives us in his word for parents. And so parents can say, okay, God, if this is what you tell me to do, I'll do it. I'm going to be faithful. I'm going to plant the seeds, and it's your job, Lord, to change hearts and bring the growth. So the four principles are these. Number one, offer your heart to the Lord. Number two, turn your heart to your child. Number three, draw your child's heart to yours. And number four, point your child's heart to Christ. Offer your heart to the Lord. Turn your heart to your child. Draw your child's heart to yours. And point your child's heart to Christ. So in this episode, let's talk about the first one. Offer your heart to the Lord. The great commandment in Deuteronomy chapter 6, which is really the centerpiece commandment, uh, the scripture for our whole ministry here at VFM, we talk about it a lot. It says, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. These commandments that I give to you today are to be upon your hearts. Teach them diligently to your children. So as parents, sometimes we zero in on that last portion, right? Teach them diligently to your children. And we talk about family worship and all those things. But look at everything that comes before that. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. These commandments that I give to you today are to be upon your hearts. And after all that, then God says, teach them diligently to your children. Are you noticing an order here? Are you noticing a priority here? God says, you, 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 you. And okay, now let's talk about the kids. So the principle here is that we simply cannot lead our children in a direction we're not going in ourselves. And this is not about thou shalt be a perfect Christian in order to help your children be perfect Christians. This is about us humbly seeking to follow Jesus personally and then inviting our children to join us in that journey. Now, in our counseling ministry, we really see parents on two mindset spectrums. Here's what I mean by that. We talk to some parents who take total responsibility for how their kids have turned out. And we talk to other parents who seem to take no responsibility for how their kids have turned out. So the full responsibility parents, they blame themselves. They blame themselves for everything. 
woulda, coulda, shoulda. If I had only done this, if I had only done that, if they could go back and, and rewind the clock and parent differently, they, they blame themselves for every choice their adult kids have made. Then we have people on the other side of the spectrum who they say something like this. Well, you know, Rob, we uh, we did our best. Raised those kids in the church, did the best we knew how to do. And our kids are going to make their own choices. And we have no responsibility here whatsoever uh, for how these kids have turned out. Now, I want to suggest to you that both of these mindsets are unbiblical and terribly unhelpful. Uh, unbiblical. Is it really true that we are totally responsible for everything that our kids do? No, we're not. They are free moral agents, right, in the theological uh, term. Ezekiel 18 talks about how God deals individually with each person. Just because the Father follows God doesn't automatically mean the Son is going to follow God. And in the same way, on the other side, can we actually say we have no responsibility for how our kids uh, turned out? I hope that's not true, because what that means is that there is no correlation between faithfulness and parenting and outcomes. I hope that's not true. I hope there's a correlation between faithfulness and parenting and how our kids actually launch from the home. So the truth is we're not totally responsible. There's things that we cannot control. And what can we do as parents to deal with the things we can't control? We can pray. We can pray fervently. We can pray faithfully. We can pray for God to work in the hearts of our kids. I can't change the hearts of my children. You can't change the hearts of your children. Only God can do that. We have to pray and ask him to do it. On the other side, we can't say that we have no responsibilities because we have partial responsibilities. We actually had a role to play in how our kids turned out. Unfortunately, we can't go back and get a do-over. We can't go back and undo mistakes that we've made. However, as Christians, there's something very powerful and very important that we can do as we look back at parenting failures, there's something we need to do, and that's repent. Let me try it this way. Let me ask you, uh, how many of you were perfect parents? Raise your hand for me if you were a perfect parent. You say, oh, no, I'm not perfect. You know, we all fall short. Okay, great. How many of you did some things wrong as a parent? Now, I, ask, I ask these two questions at seminars all the time. I say, how many of you were perfect parents? And one hand goes up because there's some jokester out there. But then, uh, so, so say, no, 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 we weren't perfect. And then I ask the question, well, how many of you did some things wrong then as a parent? And at that point, 50% of the hands go up. And I'm like, well, okay, listen, if you didn't raise your hand for the first one, you have to raise your hand for the second one. It's the same question. Um, but then we, we press into that. We say, oh, okay, yes, we all fall short of the glory of God. We all did some things wrong. Okay, great. Well, then, like what? In other words, could you name for me areas of failure and sin for you as a parent? Could you name them? And then the next question is, have you ever taken those things, whatever you would name, whatever you might jot down on a three by five card, could you, have you taken those things to the Lord to repent and to confess those things? Now, listen, hear me. I'm not asking you to wallow in past sin or past failure here. That's not the point. The point is that I'm going to be challenging you and encouraging you to accelerate your ministry to your child, to to pick up the pace, to pursue them. But the problem is a lot of us have a ball and chain of past unconfessed sin around our life. And so we're not going to be able to accelerate. We're not going to be able to pick up the pace. We're not going to be able to pursue if we've got a ball and chain of unconfessed past sin around our life. So what do we need to do? Identify the sin, take it to Jesus, confess it. He paid the full price for that sin on the cross. Receive his forgiveness. Have that ball and chain broken so that we can then pursue our ministry to these kids, our ministry to our adult sons and daughters who need us. Maybe they need us more than they've ever needed us before. Well, we're going to continue this conversation in our next episode. As I said earlier, if you've got prayer requests, please send those to us at podcast at visionaryfam.com, and you can do a deep dive. I'm skimming the surface of, of an entire resource that we have for you called Never Too Late. Never Too Late, Encouraging Faith in Your Adult Child. It's available as a book. It's available as a Kindle book. It's also available as a video Bible study for your church or a class or a small group. And you can learn all about the Never Too Late book, the Never Too Late video series at our website, Visionary 
visionaryfam.com, visionaryfam.com. It's never too late for God to use you to make a spiritual impact in the life of your son or your daughter. And I look forward to continuing this conversation with you on our next episode of Family Vision. Family Vision.